Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my topic today is the notions of center and periphery as they relate to the international spread of the English language over the last several centuries. As we've heard, Larry was a pioneer in researching this phenomenon beginning in the late 1970s and in working together with Braj Khatri was instrumental in establishing the field known as World Englishes. The idea is that we have more than one English. There's not just one form that everyone speaks. This subject of powerful centers and marginalized peripheries is a timely one in today's world, given, for example, the developments that we see in the current US presidential campaign and the recent vote in the UK to leave the European Union. On a positive note, the topic of center and periphery is an appropriate one, I think, for honoring Larry with respect to his scholarship and his exceptional humanity. Larry committed himself to bridging the perceived gulf between centers and peripheries, to ensuring that everyone's voice is heard and acknowledged, and to being inclusive, as the acronym for World Englishes, W-E, or WE, demonstrates. For the English language, the terms center and periphery have a particular significance given the unprecedented number of users the language has around the world today. The world's users of English in total are mono and multilinguals whose proficiency in the language varies widely. They include learners of English in the early stages of acquiring this linguistic code to highly proficient speakers who use English as their primary or in some cases only language for communication. They are members of countless speech communities around the globe located here in the Pacific on Hawaii, and in Africa, Asia, the British Isles, continental Europe, and North and South America. Among these countless speech communities, there are a notable few that are powerful centers for the language and hold varying degrees of, att of attraction and influence. The overwhelming majority of speech communities, however, are regarded as relative peripheries of English use, or have been regarded, I should say some closer to, other, others further from those centers. Given how widely English is learned and used in so many speech communities around the globe, a complex set of dynamics and tensions exists between these centers and perceived peripheries. Considering English use on a broader global scale as opposed to on a regional or local level, there are three especially powerful centers for the language. And as I was going through that list of where English was spoken, I imagine most of you were thinking of those centers in your mind. Um, one is the historical center in the British Isles, where English initially emerged some 1,500 years ago. A second is the political center for the language in the United States, the result of the dominant role that country has played internationally since World War II. The third is the language's economic center, again, in the United States, which has been the world's largest economy for more than a century. Given the power of these three centers, the varieties of English used within them enjoy a particular status and prestige, attributes that are valued and are recognized, arguably, by all people. These notions of status and prestige, however, simultaneously encourage a perception of language as something monolithic, having a single correct and desirable form. Although common, this popular view, in fact, stands in contradiction to the fundamental social reality of how language works and functions, and this is what Larry dedicated his scholarship to. As one of the most lauded sociolinguists of the contemporary era, William Labov noted already more than 40 years ago, language is a social phenomenon, a form of social behavior used by human beings in a social context, communicating their needs, ideas, and emotions to one another. As such, a language, in fact, is subject to its particular users and their personal uses for it. Every language is shaped and formed by those who use it, whoever they may be, as they interact within their respective communities. Therefore, the emergence of different types or varieties of a language, such as Canadian English, Hawaiian English, and I want to mention also um, what uh, we 
heard the introduction about Hawaiian Pigeon. I also saw that PBS show last night in my hotel room. It was a wonderful program. Uh, Hawaiian English, Singapore English, British English, and German English, even, across speech communities is inevitable. Plurality of language, not a monolithic singularity, is the de facto social reality of language use, something that is especially well exemplified in the case of English. Larry essentially dedicated one part of his very rich, full life to bridging this linguistic gap between the perceived center and the periphery of the world's English users. Working together with Raj Kotru, he co-founded the International Association for World Englishes, and he was the co-founding editor of the academic journal World Englishes, now in its 35th year of publication. As colleagues and in collaboration, Larry and Raj Kotru explored the significance of the widespread plurality of the English language with its accompanying center versus periphery dynamics and tensions for nearly four decades. This plurality is captured in the theory of world Englishes, which maintains that if we recognize British English, a general variety of the language spoken in the British Isles, where the language first emerged, as well as the existence of American English, standard American English, I should say, a newer variety spoken in the world's dominant political and economic power of the last century, then such acknowledgments of the inherent community-based nature of language use cannot be limited to the language's historic, economic, and political centers. Recognition in the form of naming practices is equally valid for all varieties of English, spoken in speech communities wherever they may be in the world, irrespective of how much relative power and influence they have. The fact that the code of English is used so widely in the world with each speech community having to varying degrees its own distinct features of pronunciation, vocabulary, phrasing, etc., creates a situation in which center and periphery relationships between communities emerge. With respect to predominantly monolingual speech communities, in which English is the primary language of use, there are varieties with distinct linguistic features and norms of usage spoken in other parts of North America and the Pacific identified, for example, on a macro level as Canadian English, Australian English, New Zealand English, etc. Since these predominantly native language, or better said, first language varieties, are used in speech communities located outside the language's most conspicuous centers of power, they historically have been regarded as on the periphery with respect to the higher status varieties of British English and American English which as Kotru states, much of the public continues to perceive as a, quote, elite group, providing the models for emulation, unquote. However, in light of the highly diversified reality of English use around the world today, it is inadequate to view the language solely in the traditional, limited sense of functioning as an L1, or first language, in a predominantly monolingual community. A comprehensive understanding of English as a code for communication requires taking into account all of its users and their uses for it, wherever in the world such speech communities may be, and irrespective of how long they have been using the language, for over a thousand years, a few centuries, or mere decades. This notably includes those who use English along with one or more historically local, regional, national languages, that is, communities in which multilingualism has become, or is becoming, normal practice. As a result, this added dimension of English use as one of two or more languages used within multilingual communities creates an additional center periphery dynamic, with L1 English speech community users collectively constituting a center, and multilingual speech communities relegated to a periphery. The widespread use of English in the world as an L1, and in fact, to a far greater extent, as an additional language, or L2, with mul within multilingual speech communities, is a relatively recent phenomenon in the language's long history. While arguably most of the world's languages are used primarily as L1s, in the case of English, this was a defining characteristic only earlier in the language's history, prior to the beginning of the period of British colonialism. 
expansionist efforts to gain territories overseas, starting in the late 16th century with settlement colonies in Ireland and North America, created the conditions for introducing the Code of English to communities under British colonial rule. Especially in Asia and Africa, English began to be used as an additional language, in spite of the absence of a large number of L1 English using immigrants in these regions. Used in addition to one or more already established community languages, English over time gained a range of uses in these regions, most prominently in the domains of business, trade, politics, and or education. It further acquired a significant societal depth of use in terms of the number of users within these populations. Consequently, it is inaccurate to perceive these multilingual Asian and African communities as having simply adopted the English language with an expectation that they use the code in a way that is identical to how L1 users in the language's historical center of the distant British Isles speak. A more accurate characterization is that the language, the English language was not only adopted, but also adapted by its new users. The adaptation of code is something that all language users, both mono and multilingual alike, engage in in response to their individual needs for communication within their particular cultural contexts of use. Language adaptation, a part of the broader phenomenon of language change, is a normal linguistic process, one that occurs in all speech communities around the world, over time and across distances, be they physical or social. Just as contemporary English in today's United Kingdom shows marked distinctions from the English of Shakespeare in the 16th century, and the present day English spoken by the Queen of England differs from that of working class Londoners, so too has the English language evolved and changed in its context of use in other parts of the world, in Asia and Africa, just as it did in North America and the Pacific. In the concept of world Englishes, the speech communities in which English has been predominantly used as an L1, namely those in which the English language historically first emerged, Great Britain, for example, and those established abroad by L1 uh, English using settlers, are referred to as the inner circle, a term that simultaneously acknowledges and critiques the elite status of this group of varieties which, to quote Kotru, have traditionally been recognized as models simply due to the fact they are used by the native speakers." End quote. The term inner circle highlights the problematic nature of center-periphery dynamics for the English language, with L1 users being viewed in a privileged position of authority vis-a-vis -vis the far more numerous users of English in multilingual speech communities still marginalized on a uh, periphery. These multilingual speech communities in which English is used in addition to local, regional languages are subdivided further into two groups as determined by the macro-level socio-historical factors influencing the adoption and growing uses of the language. The first, and historically older group, is the outer circle, a counter-term to the inner circle that again underlines the problematic center-periphery relationship between older, predominantly monolingual English-using speech communities and those that are multilingual with a shorter history of English use. More specifically, the outer circle refers to those speech communities already noted uh, that came into contact with English during the era of British imperialism, which peaked in the course of the 19th century. As the language of the colonial ruler, English gained status in Asian and African territories. Among the more widely known varieties of the outer circle are Singapore English, Nigerian English, and Indian English. The second group of now multilingual speech communities in which the English language has undergone a remarkable increase in its range of domains and societal depth of use is the expanding circle, a term that captures the language's especially dynamic spread in the present era to parts of the world where there is neither large-scale L1 using settler populations nor a history of formal colonial rule to facilitate language contact. Instead, during this third and youngest phase in the history of the spread of English, greater transnational interaction, both virtually through new technologies and face-to-face -face through greater mobility and travel, have motivated the growing uses of English in regions such as continental Europe and South America, as well as those parts of Asia and Africa that were never subjected to British rule. 
Key to elevating the status of English in these communities also is the rise of the L1 English using the United States as a political and economic superpower following World War II. The complexity of these center versus periphery dynamics of the English language is illustrated in Kochru's graphic for his concept of the three circles. Since Kochru introduced this visual in 1990, numerous alternative representations of the three circles have been proffered by scholars and disseminated widely in research publications, linguistics textbooks, and conference presentations to a degree that they are now more widely known in Kochru's own diagram for his concept see these alternative images now. Unfortunately, these other visuals rely on a reduced understanding of the concept, one that is based on a literal interpretation of Kachu's original terminology of three concentric circles. These alternate diagrams generally show three circles with a common middle point and the inner circle at the center, implying that the inner circle forms the core of the outer and expanding circle Englishes, or that it serves as a goal variety for outer and expanding circle users. Such renderings misrepresent the concept in significant ways and consequently have perpetuated an incorrect understanding of it. <coughs> so going back. Mm -hmm. In Kotri's original and only graphic, the three circles do not appear within one another with a common center, but are sequenced along a linear trajectory that provides a historical representation of the spread of English. Towards the bottom of the graphic, and notably not in the center, is the inner circle, the smallest of the three primary spheres. Preceding the inner circle are three smaller, unlabeled spheres signifying the historical period prior to the use of English on multiple national levels. During these phases, English was limited to local and regional level functions within smaller scale communities. Above the inner circle is the outer circle of English users, who began using the language under the distinct conditions of colonial rule. Although the use of English in this sphere began later, the outer circle dwarfs the inner circle, symbolizing the numeric superiority of outer circle users. At the top of the graphic is the expanding circle, which is larger still and represents the most recent phase of the spread of English to yet other regions of the world as a result of greater transnational interaction. The size of this sphere indicates the largest demographic of English users. Yet, in certain respects, this circle remains relegated to the furthest periphery, as it is the least studied and therefore least understood of the three primary spheres. This is a consequence of the expanding circle's relatively short history of English use, as well as the persistence of traditional historical categorizations of English as a foreign language within this sphere, used only for international purposes, in spite of the fact that a growing body of research demonstrates the language's increasing uses as an additional language that is also for international communication, as is occurring on a broader societal level. It is important that not just academics, but also the public at large gain a better understanding and in particular a critical awareness of the notions of center and periphery in general, probably, and as concerns the English language. While a monolithic view of English as it is used within the language's powerful historic, political, and economic centers may be compelling, it is fundamentally at odds with the social reality of language use. Language is a code whose forms and functions ultimately are subject to its users given their particular uses for it within specific cultural contexts. This is attested in the de facto plurality of English as it is used within speech communities around the world and it applies to communities on whatever scale they exist, local, regional, national, supranational, irrespective to the degree to which they are mono or multilingual, and regardless of whether they have been using English for over a thousand years or only a few decades. It is to this aim, eradicating this gulf between center and periphery and recognizing instead a diverse, pluralistic collectiveness of we or we, that Larry dedicated so much of his professional life and made such invaluable contributions. This is attested in his decades of work as co-founder of the International Association for World Englishes, as co-founding editor of the journal World Englishes, and as the guiding presence at more than 20 years of international conferences. Thank you.
So um, thank you very much, uh, Suzanne, Professor Hilgendorf. Um, coffee and tea will be at uh, 1040. We are, uh, I have to thank the uh, first set of presenters because we've come in ahead of time, which is a miracle. Uh, and um, just briefly, if there are any questions for uh, Fred or for Suzanne about their talk, um, does anyone have any, any, you know, it was very interesting, the, 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 the previous talk that Fred gave was, uh, I was, um, you know, fascinated by the solution you proposed at the end. You know, the problem being that if you have a, an English language class, but it's in Japan, what cultural rules, you know, what cultural practices do you follow? And um, it's, you know, all of us have experienced this, and uh, that's the, the world that Larry helped us to uh, realize that we were in. That was, that's my, friend. there might be a question. Srinath, yes. Yeah, I have a question. And that is, um, the answer to that question seems to depend on what the purpose of learning English in that context seems to be. Whether, for example, they want to interact with the native speakers, let's say American speakers, in an American context, as opposed to other speakers of Japanese, of English, in Japan. So if they were going to talk to other uh, Japanese in Japan, then probably they should be using the Japanese norm. Whereas if they are going to be talking to Americans or the British, for example, addressing them um, in one or the other way would either facilitate or uh, uh, interfere with or create misunderstanding. Yes. So, so function seems to be essential. I will, and I will repeat that. Um, so uh, Professor Sridhar is saying that it depends on the purpose for learning English. And if the purpose is to speak with other English speakers in the Japanese context, it might be appropriate to adopt Japanese norms. And then if the purpose is to interact with, uh, say, Americans speaking English, it might be appropriate to adopt American norms. Uh, uh, if I may add one yes. more sentence. Yeah. If we were uh, talking with the Japanese, then they would not probably be using English at all. They would be using Japanese. So, then so the English would become redundant. But in a country like India, for example, yeah. If uh, we are talking with other Indians yeah. who don't share our language and we use English as a medium, then we would still have the Indian cultural uh, uh, norms, such as, for instance, not addressing the person by their first name. Yes. Or, uh, for example, in Indian English, for example, in, the, in South India at least, it's very common to use the word sir uh, in addition to the last name uh, to indicate respect. It seems to be a reflex of something like G in Hindi. Yes. Uh, so if somehow we think that it would be wrong to simply say, use the name without some kind of an honorific. And yes. so this has become the norm. We, we say Sridhar sir, but they would never say Sridhar. Yes. Or Sridhar G. Or Sridhar G. Yes. Okay, and then, uh, okay, we have a couple more minutes. So could I have a response from, uh, from Fred, and then from Ayamba, and then from um, from uh, Anamika. Sorry, Anamika. Okay, so Fred. Sorry, first, sorry, quick response. Um, the purpose of for most Japanese in Japan or would not be to communicate with other Japanese right. outside of the classroom. Right. However, it would not be exclusively to communicate with Americans or British or Australians. They would also increasingly be communicating with Chinese or Koreans right. or Indians or Europeans. Right. Right. And so um, it's still not very clear. I think. Yeah. And the could, could it yeah. follow and, and it, My idea is similar to it in a sense that the student's comment applies, but they forget that the context yeah. would dictate that some That's type true. of uh, you know, uh, way of addressing the individual be acknowledged based on that in the language. The context, and yes. therefore, what Fred was talking about, how do you deal with it? In yes, the context way. becomes yeah. another question. Right. Famously, you said context of, of use, which is citing the linguist first. So, 
I mean, I know that not everybody in the audience can play the game that we're playing, but I just wanted to see how we, this, we're just, we're hitting the tennis ball back and forth, and there were some very nice shots there. I just want to say, I'm just saying. Um, and now, uh, now Avanti, and then we'll, and then we'll, and then we'll break. Although I, I do have other questions I would ask Suzanne and Bima, but we can't fit it all in. Avanti, So, uh, that takes us back to the conclusion which uh, Larry gave, that we both need to be natives as well as non-natives. Right. We need yeah. to get exposed to yeah. more and more varieties in order yeah. to get the context right. Yeah. So, so you can see where this is going. We're, we're trying to, and, and Suzanne, you definitely gave the sense, and Bimal, about that we're trying to look at language as communication. We're not just laying down the rules and saying, you know, this is how it's got to be, uh, my way or the highway. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to get away from that, but it, it's tricky. It, you know, you don't know. Like, um, like in in, uh, in Michigan, you get in line to get your things, and the the cashier, the person signing you out, will say. Um, can I help who's next? Can I help who's next? You understand what it means. It's not standard English. <laughs> Everybody in Michigan understands what it means. They just don't realize that it is in standard English. So we all say, can I help who's next? And if you come from another state or from another country, you're like, they just put two sentences and just smashed them together. <laughs> you know? Uh, so that's, that's what we're talking about. Now you can have your coffee and your tea. Please. Uh, let's start. Thank you.